Our last session for this morning before we break for lunch is on valvular heart disease. I know you're all very excited about it. And uh, we have a stellar panel today to talk about that. And our first speaker is Colin Barker. And Colin is our interventionalist guru, structure heart disease specialist, who's, you know, area from TAVR to mitral valve clips and everything else. Uh, really is our director for structure heart disease. And he'll talk about TAVR for aortic stenosis. Is it for every patient? Colin. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Um, Raise your hand if you know what Tavar is. OK, good. So almost, oh, Dr. Lowry doesn't. <laughs> so almost everybody. I was walking, just walking down here realizing that maybe there are some people, and, and there are a few who didn't raise their hands. So Tavar stands for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So it's, it's a way to put in a new heart valve um, without open heart surgery, without general anesthesia. It's done generally with, with conscious sedation. And it's become an accepted therapy, as I'll go through for high risk, intermediate risk patients with aortic stenosis. So I'll go through some uh, specific objectives regarding selecting people for this procedure re uh, with regards to the patient themselves and anatomy that they may have. Um, there are certain cardiac risk algorithms we use, even though they're designed for cardiac surgery, we apply them to this transcatheter procedure as well. The importance of a multidisciplinary team is, a, is the approach to these patients, and what some of the early data looks like as we move towards uh, lower risk patients. So in the United States today, the current approved indications for this procedure are patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. So they have to have an aortic valve area of less than 0.8 centimeters squared, or a peak velocity, as you learned in, in the echo talk earlier, of greater than four meters per second across the aortic valve, or a calculated mean gradient of greater than or equal to 40 millimeters of mercury. So those are the, those are the, the, the disease you need to have that. In addition to that, the patient has to have some clinical characteristics that put them uh, higher than low risk, meaning either intermediate, uh, high, or extreme risk for um, surgical aortic valve replacements, either due to comorbidities um, or other things like uh, a porcelain aorta, which we'll, we'll look at. And intermediate risk has now been approved for both um, the TAVR platforms, which we have available in the United States, one from uh, Edwards and one from Medtronic. So who's not an ideal uh, candidate for TAVR? So you have aortic stenosis, but then you have metastatic lung cancer and a six to 12 month prognosis. That's, that's not somebody we would be interested in treating and, and would really probably be doing a disservice. Others, generally this is a disease of the elderly, so there are a lot of comorbidities and, and a lot of debilitation. And if you have someone who's in a nursing home really not doing much and has swollen ankles and severe aortic stenosis, that's probably not somebody appropriate uh, to treat despite having the disease, et cetera. Um, sometimes there's family expectations. You know, advanced dementia or cognitive decline will not get better with a TAVR. A lot of people, and it's a reasonable hypothesis, maybe there's just less blood flow to the head, and if we fix that by fixing their blocked valve, maybe they'll get better. You know, maybe they'll perk up a little bit, um, but really that's not the case. Asymptomatic people with severe aortic stenosis as of now are not appropriate. There's an ongoing clinical trial looking at that. In addition, bicuspid aortic stenosis has not been uh, proven to be uh, a good therapy with TAVR as of now. Again, there's ongoing studies with that. And take away the aortic stenosis and talk about severe aortic insufficiency or a leaky valve. Um, that, as of now, is, is not uh, ideally treated with TAVR. Renal disease patients are tough with anything we do, um, whether it's cardiac surgery, putting in cardiac coronary stents, or a TAVR. Um, they tend to just have a poor prognosis no matter what. Now, we do treat them. A lot of the ones we treat are uh, in the um, realm of going, hopefully going for a kidney transplant. Um, but just end-stage dialysis patients are a challenge. We do treat them, but understand that the durability of the valve is generally compromised in end-stage renal disease patients. And for now, uh, low risk would only be um, acceptable in the setting of a clinical trial of which we're participating in one. So here's a typical case that we would, have, uh, that we would do. So this is an 89-year-old man, has um, risk factors, has a prior bypass surgery, renal disease, and vascular disease. 
who has aortic stenosis, but he's fairly independent. You know, he's still working, going out into his uh, ranch uh, daily, um, but just getting more fatigued, more short of breath. His calculated STS is 8.8% risk of mortality for a surgical aortic valve replacement. So this is kind of the, the typical um, TAVR patient, but it'll, it, it'll move a little bit as we'll see towards the end of this talk. When we evaluate someone beyond uh, their anatomy and um, their disease, there are a couple things in, in all of cardiovascular medicine, I would say, that help us predict uh, mortality from procedures. Age and ejection fraction have been the standard that we use as the two basic fundamental um, characteristics that predict risk, and renal function is the other powerful one. So those three alone can give us a pretty good sense of, of what the risk of cardiac surgery, a TAV, or a coronary intervention, et cetera, will be. Beyond that, though, as, as I mentioned, this is an, a, a disease of the elderly primarily. There's this um, concept of frailty and understanding how to quantify that and then how to apply a frailty assessment to evaluating a patient has become very important. And so there's, there's multiple ways to assess frailty. The FREED criteria is the most widely used and sort of standardized and validated um, criteria, but fairly involved and complex. And it's, it's broken down um, by sex, men and women. And it involves uh, the following weight loss of greater than 10 pounds or 5% weight loss over the last year would be a bad sign. There are some speeds of walking uh, 15 feet generally. If it takes you more than six or seven seconds to walk 15 feet, that's a bad sign. Um, we have a grip strength uh, uh, test we can do in the clinic that based on uh, patient's BMI, they should have a certain amount of strength where they can, that they can generate. And then a complicated uh, physical activity um, uh, calculation. So all these, th this is what's done mostly in clinical trials. It's fairly involved, um, but, it, but it's uh, validated. So what we tend to do in the clinic is something more simple that uh, is widely used, and that's called the get up and go test. And all this, and this is to assess frailty. So all this requires is for someone to get up from an armless chair without using their hands, stand for a second, walk across the room without touching the wall, turn around, walk back, sit down. Um, and you'd be amazed how many people actually can't do that. When, you're assess when, they, when they come into the office um, and they're sitting there and you interview them, you listen to them, and you might think, oh, well, all right, this is a, we're good to go here. And then you ask them, well, you know, how much can you walk? And well, I don't do much. Well, you know, do you do, your, do, you, uh, do, you do work around the house, et cetera? Well, not really. And then just ask them to do this simple, this simple test and it'll, it'll uh, add a lot to really picking appropriate people for the test. Uh, another evaluation for frailty includes the gait speed, and generally gait speeds faster than a meter, a meter per second um, suggest healthier aging. And if your gait speed is less than 0 0.6 meters per second, uh, there's unlikelihood that doing a TAVR is really gonna benefit someone in, this, um, in that situation. So there are several cardiac risk scores, again, designed and applied to surgical aortic valve replacement, but have been used in, in transcatheter aortic valve replacement studies as far as getting a, 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 a high-level sort of risk assessment. There's the European scores, the logistic Euroscore and Euroscore 2. The one we use uh, and apply is the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, or STS score. Um, these are great. They're simple. They both have apps that we can quickly uh, run this calculation. It's, it's in every note when we do an assessment of someone or a consult on someone uh, for a transcatheter aortic valve. Um, but again, has never been totally validated when applied to transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Different procedure. Um, and some of the uh, limitations of these uh, scores and, and risk scores is that they tend to overestimate someone's risk particularly at the high ends of the scale. And they don't incorporate, even though we, we keep saying this for years, they don't incorporate things like a porcelain aorta, which would be a calcified aorta, chest wall radiation, liver cirrhosis, and pulmonary hypertension, which we know increases someone's risk for surgery, but is not included in any of these calculations of these scores. So beyond that, um, really, clinical judgment should supersede any, any risk algorithm. And we use these scores to guide, not dictate therapy. And really, the best test is the eyeball test, and it's not where the gut feeling you get when you see someone in the hospital or in the clinic. And the, one of the benefits I think that TAVR has brought around is the idea of this heart team concept. It's not just 
what I think, it's what I think, what Dr. Laurie thinks, what Dr. Lil thinks, and then as a group, we sort of have a discussion and decide what's, what's the uh, most appropriate therapy for this patient. So moving into low risk, um, there are two large trials in the United States that are ongoing. As I mentioned, we're participating in one of them. And so rather than speculate on those results, we'll just sort of have to wait and see. But there has been a low risk trial done in Europe called the Notion trial. And this uh, was designed to compare uh, TAVR versus surgical AVR in low risk patients who are um, over 70 years old. The primary outcome was a composite, meaning a collection uh, or combined all cause mortality, stroke, and myocardial infarction at one year. There was also a safety, some safety secondary outcomes. And this was a prospective multicenter, obviously non-blinded. You can't blind someone whether or not they had an open heart surgery. Um, randomized trial, which was done now several years ago, between 2009 and 2013. So it's important to remember at that time, uh, this was early technology. One of the other issues at that time, all the sizing was actually based on echocardiography. And in our contemporary practice, all the sizing is done by CT scan uh, due to uh, improvements in accuracy of really getting a size of the annulus. So the baseline uh, characteristics include the following, but what I've highlighted in red is the uh, STS scores in both the transcatheter and the surgical arms around three. So generally we would, you know, less than four is considered low risk. Um, and relatively healthy population when you compare it to who we're used to treating uh, in the transcatheter world. And it's nice because now we have data from this trial out to six years. So this is um, all-cause mortality uh, on the y-axis and time on the x out to 72 months. And you can see the uh, TAVR group in red and the surgical group in blue. And the conclusion looking at this should be they're essentially the same. There, there's no difference in all-cause mortality um, out to uh, six years. But I thought what's interesting, one of the criticisms or one of the issues with TAVR has been, is it going to be durable? And I think what happened here is very interesting. So here is the uh, structural valve deterioration out to six years. So um, meaning the valve becomes re-narrowed or it starts to leak and you need another procedure or something done or just you're sort of suffering with a dysfunctional uh, artificial valve. And what you can see is actually out to six years, it's not the TAVR that actually runs into problems, it's the surgical valves. 24% at six years had significant structural valve deterioration, where only 4.8% uh, of the TAVRs had any structural valve deterioration. So I think this will start to maybe put to rest the concerns um, about TAVR as far as durability. Uh, and is one of the more important findings, I think, of this study. So through six years, um, the hemodynamic valve performance was maintained and was actually superior to TAVR compared to uh, surgical valves. Structural valve deterioration was um, significantly less, and there was no valve thrombosis uh, or endocarditis in either group. So one thing to keep in mind when we assess people uh, for any procedure is that their risk can be a very dynamic um, uh, feature, meaning this is, a, this is a patient we were consulted on several years ago, a 91-year-old, very small, frail, kidney disease, coronary disease, mild dementia, but, but independent, presented with acute decompensated heart failure, low ejection fraction. She had both severe aortic stenosis and severe mitral regurgitation with pulmonary hypertension. So her calculated STS risk score was 21% for um, just uh, aortic valve replacement, not both valves. And so that's somebody we would look at as, as fairly high risk. So this is when she presented on the left um, with a BNP of 4,000 and a calculated valve area of 0 0.29 centimeters squared. So this is someone we would, we would I think, agree is probably a little too sick, uh, somebody we, we don't think would, would benefit for now. But she gets a valvuloplasty. Her EF improves a little bit. Her mitral regurgitation, since it was secondary or functional mitral regurgitation, improved. Her BNP came down. There was a, you know, she still has severe aortic stenosis despite the um, uh, valvuloplasty, which is no surprise, but it, it increased the area about, about double. Um, and clearly, clinically, I don't need to tell you, but just looking at her chest x-ray, she improved. She's not intubated. She's not in pulmonary edema. She's out of the ICU. She's on the floor. You know, now is she a TAVR candidate? And we would probably say, yeah, actually, now she is. So it, it's a, an important concept to, to um, 
sort of understand that this dynamic component to risk assessment, you know, at one point in time is not always uh, the, the only time someone can be evaluated for uh, transcatheteric valve replacement. So who's the ideal TAVR candidate? Well, in the United States right now, high extreme and intermediate risk patients um, are appropriate. Uh, the assessment must include some evaluation of their functional status and frailty. It uh, mandates a multidisciplinary heart team to discuss and reach a consensus. And for low risk, we'll have to wait and see when the large randomized trials uh, conclude. Thank you.